Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Lee. Um, today, I want to share some uh, interesting work we have done to uh, implement preemptive scheduling in a Mesos framework. So, uh, a little about me, uh, I am a software engineer at Two Sigma. Two Sigma is a quantitative hedge fund uh, that's based in uh, New York City. Uh, it is a technology company that, you, uh, that applies math, computer science, and engineering in the field of, of finance and investment. So this talk is about Mesos, and Two Sigma uses it a lot. As a matter of fact, I think Two Sigma is powered by Mesos. We run a lot of data center that runs uh, Mesos, and we run a range of uh, frameworks on top of that. Some of them are uh, open source frameworks such as a Marathon and Spark, and some of them are uh, developed at Two Sigma to solve more specific uh, use cases. So the framework I'm going to talk about today in particular is the one that we uh, wrote at Two Sigma called Cook. So uh, what is Cook? Cook is a Two Sigma simulation platform. At the very high level, Cook manages tens of thousands of simulations. And since Cook is a shared platform, it's also responsible for a shared computation resource among all users. So what is a simulation? Simulation is a tool that uh, the quantitative researcher at Two Sigma uses to backtest their ideas about investment, about market. At very high level, they are just idempotent, distributed, and resource-intensive computations. And people really run just one simulation. People usually run simulation in a batch fashion. We call them simulation set. A simulation set can have anywhere from a handful to thousands of simulations. And one simulation is implemented as multiple Mesos tasks run running in parallel. So let's now look at what a simulation task looks like in terms of um, you know, resource consumption. It takes 10 to about 10 to 100 gigabytes of memory, takes 1 to 20 CPUs, and it can take anywhere from 15, 15 minutes to a, a few hours to run. And people run simulations for all kinds of uh, different purposes. But mostly, there are really uh, two major use cases here. The first is called uh, interactive research. This kind of simulation workload that consumes a relatively uh, small amount of uh, memory and CPU, and they run uh, much, much faster. They run about uh, from half hour to an, uh, to an hour, and people are usually actively waiting for the result. So they want to see the result to decide what to do next. It's a latency-intensive uh, workload. The second type is, uh, is uh, more like batch computation. This type of workload, they consume a lot more resource, and they run for much longer, and they are less latency intensive. People really don't care too much about the latency as long as they complete um, overnight, over weekend, or, or whatever. So given the mixture of those two types of uh, workload, Cook really faces a very high resource demand. Uh, at peak hours during business day, the request we receive, they, uh, they might require you know, more than five, five times the total capacity of the cluster. So given such uh, demand, we're really trying to optimize for two things here. The first is, of course, utilization. We want to, because of we have so much, uh, so much demand, we want to utilize the cluster as much as possible. We want to run those workloads as fast as possible. A second is, is fairness. Again, because Cook is shared by multiple research teams, by multiple uh, researchers, we want to allocate the cluster resource fairly among our users. Well, for some definition, for some definition of fair. So here, the meaning of utilization is quite straightforward, but fairness might require a little bit of thinking. What does that mean? What is, what is fairness? So fairness has a lot of definitions, and there are a lot of ways to achieve fairness. So let's see some examples. 
first thing, first, uh, first come, first serve is is used a lot in our real life to uh, to achieve fairness. When we go to a store, we go to some kind of services. It's usually first come, first serve. So that is that is pretty fair. Time sharing is another way to achieve fairness. We, for instance, in our case, we can say, well, we partition a day into twenty-four uh, into one-hour chunks, and we can you know fairly share the cluster among 24 researchers by giving each of them one hour to use the cluster. Or we can throw a dice every morning and say, you know, who's going to use the resources depending on the output, output of, of the throw. So these are all different kinds of definition of fairness, and they are all fair, you know, in, in, in according to their own definition. But what is, what is the fairness we really want? What is, uh, what does fair, uh, fairness really mean to us? So let me tell a story of our user. Let me tell a story of how the researcher is going to uh, is, is using our cluster um, for, to do their daily life. So imagine yourself being a researcher at Two Sigma. I mean, one day you have this great idea and you want to run simulations to, to test the idea, obviously. So you submit your simulations and you know, uh, they expect, you expect them to complete in an hour because, you know, the resource they're going to use. So this is great, an hour for lunch, so you go get some lunch, you have this great lunch, fully energized, you're ready to go. You're very excited, you sit down, you start to look at the results. At what point you, you realize the results ha has not come back yet? As a matter of fact, your simulations are sitting in the queue waiting to be scheduled. So you're kind of upset at this point because this is you know, preventing you from uh, doing your job. You really need to see those results to, to do interactive research. So what makes you more upset is when you look at the cluster utilization where you see yourself being here, you see yourself only using a tiny bit of the total, total resource while other users are using much, much more. At this point, you, you get kind of angry, actually. You, a few words pop in your mind, and you say, you know, this is not fair, I have to talk to someone about this. I can assume this is what happens next, so, scary. Um, anyway, so what is, fairness, what is fairness really? What I'm trying to tell here. So I think fairness is not about fair. It's kind of weird, but if you think back in, in the story, the researcher would not need to uh, even look at the, the fairness distribution if he gets his results back in the first place. So fairness here re really means user experience. Fairness is just a way to make sure our user has the uh, has resource to do uh, to do the job, and therefore, the fairness kind of becomes more clear to us. It means to us that the user should get their share of the cluster whenever needed to, to do their job. It's, it's very critical that should be latency, uh, the latency should be small. So thinking of that, then, you know, all the five-fold time sharing or throw a dice approach obviously doesn't work because it doesn't help too much here. Okay, so far we talk about what's the problem we're facing and what we think about what kind of fairness we really need. Now let's talk about how do we do it? How do we implement fairness? Well, the simplest approach we can think of is to use a quota. Quota is essentially the max percentage of a cluster we allow a single user to use at any, mo at any moment in time. The quota can be computed statically just by you know, dividing the total amount of resource by the max number of concurrent users we think we're going to handle. And the advantage is quite clear. It guarantees fairness. It's basically reserving the resource for each user so they can get them whenever they want. And of course, an obvious disadvantage of this is at least to poor utilization, right? I mean, during daytime, we can still have maybe 90 or even 80 percent, oh, sorry, 80 or even 90 percent utilization, but during night, because of the number of concurrent users gets much, much lower, the utilization drops down to 30, 40% while we have a lot of you know, batch computation sitting in the queue throttled by their quota. This is obviously not good, so we're going to try to improve it. 
So a natural thing to, to think about to do next is, is we want to adjust the quota based on the cluster utilization. So the lower the utilization is, the higher we want the quota to be such that we can um, utilize the cluster much, much better. So this helps us. This leads to a higher utilization during, uh, during those um, non-peak hours. Um, the utilization can go up from 30, 40 percent to 70 or even higher percentage. However, this approach also brings another problem, which is um, poor utilization. Let's take a look like at this. Uh, and basically, if you think about this, we, uh, at first, the cost of utilization is low, and the first couple of users, they can grab a much more quota to run their job. And as users come in, the utilization increases, and the later users basically uh, get uh, less quota. So we end up, end up in the unfair resource allocation on the left side. And what we really want is the fair resource allocation uh, on the right side. And the problem is, even though the quota can adjust to the utilization really quickly, the allocation is not. It actually usually takes us uh, hours to go from the left side to the right side, simply because we don't have a great way to uh, re reclaim resources and reallocate them. The only way we have is to wait those uh, workload to complete and then to reallocate those empty resources. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the simulation tasks, they can take hours to run, and that's why we have these long delays. And they're very um, programmatic for us because it costs, um, that leads to very bad user experience. So can we do better? We have talked about static quota, which is great in fairness and poor, poor in utilization. We've talked about dynamic quota, which is uh, kind of the opposite. So can we find something that is both good in fairness and utilization? Well, not surprisingly, the answer is yes, and the, the, the way we, uh, we use is by using preemption. Preemption here simply means, you know, you kill a simulation task and reschedule it later. The very important idea behind preemption is it is a way for us to fast reclaim resource. So instead of taking hours from um, going from the left side to the right side, we, it only takes a minute for us to do so by using preemption, by fastly, actively preempting those resources and uh, reallocate them. So I think this is great. We think this is going to work. So how do we do it? Preemption isn't trivial. It, uh, more specifically, what's the principle we should use to decide on uh, which task to preempt under what condition? Well, let me, let's try to walk through the example to see some ideas, some intuition behind uh, how we think we should do preemption. Well, let's say here we have a class of six CPUs. We have two users. Each of them is, is running three of their tasks, and each one of the tasks is taking one CPU. So they happily share the cluster fairly. So now enters a new user, Dave, at this point, and now we kind of enter an unfair allocation I mentioned earlier. We know eventually we want each user to have two tasks running and one task waiting. To, this is uh, the fair allocation we want to reach. But we don't really know which of those uh, six running tasks we should preempt. Well, let's, let's try something. One thing we do know is we know uh, that Jerry, Jerry and Kevin here, they are uh, above their fair share. They're using uh, half the cluster while they should only be using uh, one third. So we think, well, we can preempt some of the jobs, uh, which are marked as um, orange here. And, uh, to, and we know we want to schedule the uh, Dave's job, which is uh, marked as yellow. But other than that, we don't have uh, a great idea of how we should do that. So let's just say here we decide to preempt one of Jerry's tasks in, in, in red, and we end up like this, and we just do this again for Dave's second task, and in which case only Kevin is above the fair share, so we only uh, consider Kevin's task for preemption. And again, we, we, we just pick one because we don't know better, and we end up like this. So this kind of 
this looks pretty similar to to what we want to achieve. Each user is using two, uh, is, each user is running is running two tasks. So we think we uh, we've done a good job here, but did we? Actually, the answer is no. We did not do a great job here, and the reason for that is we here we simply assume each task are, are equal to each other uh, from the user's point of view. And that is not true. The problem is not all tasks are equal to users, and we might have just preempted some very uh, important task. And that's, again, lead to bad user experience, and again, that's what we're trying to pre uh, prevent in the first place. So, the natural thing to do next is we want to have some way to express the difference among those tasks. We want to have a score function that can reflect a task's value. And the value should really mean two things we've talk, talked about so far. The first thing is the fairness. The value should, should um, reflect our ideas about how should we um, allocate the resource fairly. And second, the value is about the importance of a task. So if we have the score function, our, our preemption principle should be simple. It should be just to preempt lower score task for a higher score task. So let's go back to the previous example to see how we can use this idea to do a, a better job. Well, first one thing we don't quite know is how do we decide the relative importance among all tasks, right? It's kind of a hard thing because it's, it's hard for us to say, you know, Jerry, your job is more important than Kevin or, or vice versa. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard. But one thing we do, uh, we do know how to do is we know how to express you know, the relative importance of a task among the, the same user. Actually, the user has a way to tell us which of uh, his tasks he thinks is more important. So here we represent uh, each uh, the importance of task by using uh, currency here, and as you have you have uh, noticed, they are uh, they're in different currency, so we we cannot compare them uh, across users yet. And now the fairness comes into play. Now we apply our principle of fairness by saying, well, you know what? I don't really know which one of your uh, tasks are more important, so I just have to be fair to all users. I'm gonna say the most important task of, of, of each user are of same value, and so on and so forth. So we translate the currency, uh, the different currency in the previous slide into the unified currency here. This is essentially our score. So having this, having this score preemption makes, uh, becomes easier, right? Again, like I mentioned, when we, we, are, when we are trying to uh, schedule the task in yellow, we just look at all tasks that has a, a lower score than it. And the reason we have to look at multiple here instead of just the lowest one is because we have to do preemption uh, with the constraint of bin packing. We have to make sure the one in yellow can be scheduled after the preemption. The resource is enough for it to run. So let's say, he, uh, let's say here we preempt, again, Jerry's task in, in, uh, in red. We do this, and we look at the second task, and this time there's only one candidate um, for preemption. There's only one task with a lower um, score. And we, did, and we did that, and we end up like this. This looks uh, a little bit better than previously, because first, it is a fair allocation, and the second, we are running the more important task for each user. So this is great. So we've talked about intuition so far. We kind of know what, um, how, we want to, how we want to do the preemption. We kind of know what the score function looks like. And next, the, th the thing next I want to talk about is how do we formalize it? How do we actually express that you know, in math and in and computer science. So we, uh, we introduced this notion of cumulative resource share. The idea is this. Assuming there is a total order of, of task for each user, which greater means uh, more important than. So that's the same thing we did with different currencies. 
Given that, we are saying, we are saying um, the cumulative resource share of a task, or CRS, is the sum of all the tasks of the same user that are greater or equal to T and divided by the total cost of resource. So here is the, the same thing in mathematical formula. We sum up all the tasks of, uh, of the resource of all, all the tasks that are more important, and again, we divide it by the total resource. To show a quick example, um, so from our previous example, again, to recap, we have six CPUs. Each task is taking one. Let's say we, we do the calculation for a, uh, for a single user. Here, uh, there's three tasks, A, B, C. A is more important than B, B is more important than C. And we just do the calculation, CRS of A is just the resource of A divided by total resource, and CRS of B is the sum of R and RB, uh, and CRS C is, is the same idea. So by doing that, again, let's, say, let's look at the same example to see how that worked out. So we have this ordering, we calculate CRS. One thing to mention here is before when we talk about score and value, um, the higher the currency you have, the more important the task is. And when we introduce cumulative resource share, it's opposite. It's the more important task has the lower CR CRS, just to, uh, just to keep in mind here. So again, we do the exact same thing in, in the example, but this time with, the, with CRS. And we're trying to find a task with higher CRS uh, in this case. And we do this, and we do the exact same thing, and we end up like this. So this looks like it's gonna work. CRS seems to be a good uh, a proxy of how do we want to express the value. So one thing is we, only, we have only defined a, a cumulative resource share on a single type of resource. But in reality, we need to handle multiple types of resource in a single cluster. So how do we do that? Well, luckily for us, there's already uh, some uh, results about that. It's called a dominant resource share. It is a way to do fair allocation of multiple resource types in a single cluster. It was published actually by UC Berkeley in 2011 with some, uh, along with the, the work with Mesos, and it's used in Mesos itself as a way to uh, allocate resources to different frameworks. Uh, an, an important idea in this paper is called dominant resource share. It's defined on the user, and the, the, the dominant resource share of a user is just at the max across all its resource share and the resource share is trivial as uh, the amount of resources you use divided by the total. So this is a simple yet very powerful notion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting property uh, mentioned in this paper, um, but I, I won't go to too much detail, but I, I would strongly suggest reading this paper. It's, it's, it's very cool. So here, um, I have to apologize, naming, the name is getting a little bit long, but you know, name, name is hard, so. Um, Dominant cumulative resource share. So again, to recap, we define CRS to be, you know, uh, sum of all the, the resources of, of, of all the tasks that are more important and divided by the total resource. And to extend the idea to multiple resources, it's, it's straightforward. It's, uh, you just calculate CRS across all resources and you take the max uh, across them. And finally, we have our score function to be the negation of DCRS. And again, the idea is we want the higher score to represent higher, uh, more important, and uh, DCRS or CRS, they, they work the opposite. The, the more important task has a lower uh, dominant accumulated resource share, so we simply do the neg negation here. Um, nothing too fancy. So we talk about a lot about how we, do, how we define our score function. And we talk a little bit about the idea behind it. We want to achieve fairness and we want to reflect importance. And there's one more thing I want to say about the idea behind it. It is, 
And this is, uh, th the score function we come up with is really designed towards the goal of uh, optimizing user experience. Uh, and let me explain that. What, what do I mean by that? So one very, um, one property we want the user to, to have um, by, by, by using our cluster is I want them to feel that running more workload should be free. The free should be uh, in two, two senses. First, uh, there should be no quota limitation, which is very easy to achieve. But the second point here is actually more interesting, is you know, running more workloads should be side effect free. So running more workloads should not, or in other words, running more workloads should not cost any of your uh, existing workload to be vo more vulnerable to preemption. That's very, uh, it's very important for, for the user to use it. And to do that, actually, if you think about the definition of DCRS, and again, there's a consensus among our users um, that earlier workloads are usually more important than later workloads. That's how they organize their, um, their simulations. And combining those two, and basically running wo new workloads really doesn't affect your existing workload, because the score of your existing workload is only calculated from your existing workload. That's just another idea I want to I want to communicate behind how do we come up with this cumulative idea. It's not it's not random. It really starts uh, with uh, the user experience. We want to have this nice property, and we end up designing the score function. Cool. So we talked about a lot. We've talked about the problem, the fairness. We talk about preemption. We talk about the score function idea behind it. And now let's see how do we put things together. How do we actually implement this in, in Cook, in the distributed system? Well, here is just a high-level uh, diagram for the Cook architecture. On the left side, Cook is mostly consists uh, Cook mostly consists of three components. The one on the left is called the ranker. The ranker only does one simple thing. It takes all the tasks in the system sorted um, by user, oh, sorry, sorted per user, calculate the score for each one of them, and merge them back into a sorted list. This list is then passed into two components. The one on the top is called matcher, and its functionality is also simple. Its functionality is trying to match the list of sorted tasks with uh, the offer it gets from Mesos. It's trying to use those offers to run a more important task. And the one on the bottom side is called the rebalancer. The rebalancer is the module or the component that actually does the preemption we've been talking about so far. Let's just uh, zoom in to see what it does. It's also quite simple. It breaks down the list of tasks into the waiting and the running. Similar to the matcher, it's trying to do a matching process. But unlike the matcher, it's uh, doing the matching process between waiting task and running task. It's essentially tre treating running task as a potential source of uh, resource offers. And the idea that it does it is, is also, like we talked about, it checks two things. First is if the running task, the score of the running task is uh, lower than the waiting task. And the second, if the waiting task can be fit on the host after the preemption. And here, a quick example, to, schedule, to, uh, to trying to schedule E, we look at those two hosts. The first is running, uh, the, on the first host, we look at BC for preemption. On the second host, we look at D, and we, for, and we decide that BC is a better option. So we preempted that and uh, put, e on, put the E on the host. So that's just a quick overview of how things work. It's quite simple. Um, now, the one, one thing I want to talk about is the idea behind this design. Again, why, why do we design the system the way it is designed? The first thing is it's really designed for Mesos API. So far, when we talk about uh, preemption, we always uh, think it is as a transactional operation. It's a swap operation. You swap a running task with a waiting task. However, such operation is, is a little bit difficult to express using Mesos API. Mesos provide you two API. The first is launch task, the second is kill task. They're independent and there's no 
you know, swap operation. Because of that, we, we change our thinking of preemption. We don't think preemption as this atomic operation because it's really hard to, to express in, in the Mesos world. Instead, we think it as an optimization problem. We think it as an optimization process that's carried out by two steps. The first step is the preemption part. You free up a bunch of resources you think they are lower priority. And the second step is the, is the matching process. The matcher takes the freed up resource and schedule more important tasks, schedule high value, uh, high score tasks. And by doing that, the total score in the system increases. And that's the ultimate goal of, of this. That's the, the basic idea behind this problem is to try to increase the total score in the system. The second thing I want to talk about is simplicity versus accuracy. Because one, one potential issue you might think of, of of this approach is it's not accurate, right? You're, you're trying to, the rebalance is trying to say, you know, I want to um, schedule things such, such way. However, the actual thing that the matcher is going to do might be different. The whole process isn't, isn't that accurate. But the thing I want, I want to really want to make here is, uh, like, uh, like, like the keynote talk by, by Noah about simplicity versus performance, and sometimes accuracy isn't that important. We, uh, sometimes it's a good trade-off to trade uh, accuracy for simplicity. If we, have, if we want to achieve accuracy, we need to have maybe some kind of complex bookkeeping to make sure uh, the thing, the rebalancer thing, should be done is actually done. Actually, but, but in fact, I don't think that's, that is that important in the system because eventually the goal is really to increase the total score of the system so we can do some, um, we can tolerate some inaccuracy in the entire process as long as eventually things work. So we, we bring, we've asked this problem before, uh, can we do better? Can we find a better approach? And now I think it's the time to answer it. We think preemption is great. We've, we've think so much about the architecture, uh, the score function, and how do we know it actually works. So finally, I want to show, uh, show you guys a benchmark that we did. I think it's very uh, interesting to look at to prove uh, the effectiveness of this algorithm. So the benchmark, we did, a simula we did actually a simulation. We implement a simulator to uh, simulate our uh, Mesos cluster as well as Kirk. So we implemented two approaches in the simulator. The first is dynamic quota. The second is preemption. We're trying to compare these two. We took a seven day production uh, uh, trace from the uh, workload trace from our system and replay it uh, in our simulator. So again, the two things we really care about is fairness and utilization. But I'm not going to show a graph of how fair the things is after that because the user don't care about that again. The thing I want to show you is how, how uh, if we have improved our user experience. So this is a graph of simulation set speed up distribution uh, results in this benchmark. So the baseline here is dynamic quota. So the speed up dynamic quota is one. It's the baseline. And we, uh, we're trying to see what's the speed up uh, distribution in the case of the preemption. Um, so to explain, a a, to explain it a little bit, so first let's look at the left side of the graph. There's 10% of the same set actually runs slower in the preemption case. Why is that? Because those are large batch computations that uh, they used to go through the night. They grab a lot of resources, they don't get preempted, and they just carry along in the dynamic quota case. That's why they, they run faster. And in preemption case, they actually get preempted, and that's exactly the thing we want to do, to preempt those uh, batch jobs from taking a lot of resources th throughout the day. But what's more interesting is on the right side. The right side, uh, we can see over 30% of the simulation set actually has a speed up. This is very important and, uh, and cool is because those simulation set are, most of them are interactive research and they are very latency insensitive. By, by 
speed up those simulation set, we achieve a better user experience. The user uh, needs to wait much, uh, much, much shorter for the simulation, interactive research simulations to come back. So great, we are, we are very happy about this. So now let's look at utilization. And one thing we only care about is that we only care about effective utilization, which means if a task is preempted, we don't want to count it uh, within our uh, cost of utilization. And this is how we, how we measure this effective utilization. We're only counting tasks that, that's not pre uh, being preempted. So here, actually, the preemption uh, has a lower utilization than the dynamic quota. And the reason for that is, again, in the dynamic quota case, those big batch uh, workload, they, they take a lot of resource, they don't get preempted, and they drive up the utilization. In the preemption case, uh, when they try to do that again, it gets preempted eventually, so uh, the resource they take um, throughout the night, they are not counted towards the utilization. And that's why you see uh, a couple of va uh, the valley here that the preemption performs worse because those are uh, overnight, and that's also expected. But also, in general, the utilization, the average utilization is actually quite close. It's only about 3% lower. Um, in, in, in this case. So we think it's a very good trade-off to trade um, the 3% utilization for a much better uh, interactive research experience. So I think we did it. I think it works. We're quite happy about the results. So that's all I want to say about Cook. I just want to feel, I would just want to spend a few moments to, to think beyond Cook. Because I think the whole idea of cumulative resource share, it comes from Mesos. And I want to raise the question of if it's possible to, to introduce this idea back into Mesos to do some uh, cool things with uh, inter-framework preemption or uh, allocation. This is a, a kind of open question because I don't have a great answer to, but I trust we as a community, we can solve this problem better then we ask to Sigma, the hedge fund uh, can, can solve this. So that's why I want to put this slide up and mention this to everyone. So lastly, open source. We are very excited that we are in the process of open sourcing the, the work we've done with Kirk, all the code, all the documentation. Unfortunately, it's not quite there yet, but we're getting really close. Um, this is the location for two Sigmas or open source projects. Um, there's a lot of cool things up there. If you're interested in anything I've talked about, if you're interested in Cook, uh, keep an eye on it. Cook will be up there one day. So that's all I want to talk. Uh, finally, I just want to shout out a couple of names here. Uh, Matt Adras, David Greenberg for helping me with de developing the original ideas. Um, David Plaitis, Wenbo Zhao, Leaf Wash, Sunil Abraham for helping me with this talk and Will. Um, Andrew, Effie, Jonathan, Nick, just for your awesome support and help. So thank you. And also thank you everyone for, uh, for giving me the opportunity here to uh, share the work we've done. Thank you for everyone. And now I'm open to uh, a few questions. We uh, have a couple of minutes, so yes, please. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, I think the question is, uh, can we do quota in Mesos? Is that is that the question? Uh, yeah, I think I think the answer is yes uh, because first uh, we don't need a quota in uh, by by using this we don't need a quota in our system and and Mesos currently doesn't have have a notion of quota so I think they they. They should play um, along well. Does that answer the question or? Uh huh. Okay.
I see, I see, I see your point. Uh, yeah, on top of my mind, I don't have a answer, but we can we can follow up. Um, yeah, later. Yeah, it's it's actually a very interesting thought. Uh, it's it's kind of, it's very pr practical thought. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, so let me repeat the question. The first question is, uh, is this per user uh, ordering purely based on submission uh, time? The second question is, uh, will that cause uh, the, the, the uh, job submitted later to be uh, kept being preempted? Okay, so the first question is, no, uh, we, designed this function, uh, we designed this user order function to be uh, flexible, actually, we have this notion of priority that you can actually jump the queue. You can say this uh, thing is submitted later, but it's actually more important. But it's designed to be flexible. We, we are even thinking of like, allow the users to choose whatever, uh, however they want to sort their, their task. So the second question is, will that cause a later task to be, uh, to be keep, uh, being keep preempted? Uh, it, it, sh it shouldn't because, well, yeah, it shouldn't because when you get uh, preempted, that means uh, someone else has a higher priority than you. And when, because the, the, the matcher and the ranker, they all use the same uh, score function, those uh, jobs that get preempted are very unlikely to be uh, scheduled uh, immediately uh, after they, they, they get preempted. They, they might be scheduled later and preempted again, but that shouldn't uh, happen very, uh, in, in a very tight loop. Uh, sorry, uh, please go ahead. So, uh, it's a, uh, so I think the question is, have we thought about uh, keeping some uh, work even if the, the task is preempted? Uh, is, is that a question? Okay, so uh, the answer is uh, we have thought about it, because, but uh, be due to the nature of the workload we're running, uh, the simulation program itself does not support uh, checkpointing very good, so um, it's kind of hard to do, but if the process itself supports checkpointing, then totally, yeah, we can preempt and uh, do checkpointing before preemption and uh, resume the task later. Uh, sorry, so, go ahead, Zanil. Uh, so, uh, so Neil's question is, can, can Cook be used to run workload other than simulation? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we've actually internally have a version of Spark that runs on Cook uh, due to some reasons. Um, yes, it's, it can be a very uh, gener generic backend and that's what we are trying to uh, make Cook. Uh, I think one, one, fi one, fi one final question. Uh, Uh, the answer is, do we increase the priority of a task being preempted? Uh, no, we, we don't do that, because I think that doesn't help the user experience, actually. Yeah. Well, maybe in our case it doesn't. Maybe in your case it's, uh, it's a different story. So. Okay, uh, thank you all again. Uh, so, enjoy the lunch. <laughs> <laughs>